Hi, uh, my name is Melanie. For those that are new here, this used to be a lifestyle channel and hopefully I've started to kind of weave some of just regular lifestyle things back in. But as of September of last year, it has become a lot more so a cancer journey channel and what all goes into that. And so I had been wanting to share this one for a while, but figured I would share now as I am most likely going back into the hospital in about a month for another surgery that will have me in the hospital for about seven to 10 days. Uh, I will update more on that later once we get all of the information about that. As of right now, it's very tentative as I have scans on at the end of September, basically. Surgery would be in October. Um, if the scans come back okay in the sense that it looks the way the surgeon wants it to look, I will have the surgery. That's it is tentatively on the schedule. If the scans come back and my face needs more time to heal, then the surgery will be canceled and I will do 20 sessions of hyperbaric oxygen therapy. I was originally, I'll update more on that later because everything has changed very quickly. I did not expect to be having surgery possibly so soon. And really, until we know all the details, it's just not speculation, but it's we don't know all the details yet. So once I know those, I will share. But um, after spending a lot of time in the hospital, having an emergency, not emergency C-section, but basically an emergency delivery, uh, there's just a lot I wanted to share about advocating for yourself when you're in the hospital or especially during a long-term medical diagnosis. Um, it can be really hard and scary and you're just kind of thrown into this tornado and a lot of information is being thrown at you and it can be really hard, but you are, or if you can't be your own advocate, you or someone you can appoint are your best advocates. Yes, the doctors are there and they have the knowledge and they have the experience, but you are yourself. Your doctor has tons of patients, tons. And while you hate to think about it like that, it's just the reality of it. They see a lot of people, um, a lot of different charts that they're looking at. So you have to be your best advocate and it really for us started from day one we our story happened really quickly i if you haven't watched any of my previous videos basically i found out at 30 weeks pregnant that i had a very large mass in my face i had squamous cell carcinoma cancer and I have now lost my eye because it extended into my eye orbit. The main mass was here and it was extending and starting to go up into, it wasn't in my brain yet, but it was starting to go up into my brain. I had kept putting off going to the NT because I chalked all those symptoms that I was having up to pregnancy and obviously it was not just sinus issues. It was big sinus issues and cancer. So the ENT that found it, just he's, he doesn't do surgery, oncology, anything like that. And he was very sweet, but he immediately, it was Labor Day weekend, and he said, it was on a Friday, and he said, you need to immediately go admit yourself into an emergency room and get care started as soon as possible. He recommended Mayo and one other hospital, so we went to Mayo, which is close to us, about two hours away. Unfortunately, when we got there, Mayo does not accept pregnant patients because they do not, the Mayo here anyways, does not have pediatrics or on, not oncology. They have oncology. They do not have 
obless obstetric, obstetrics, whatever means you're delivering a baby. They don't have that. So we're, they did admit us through the ER, but then it became a game of trying to find which hospitals to send us to that would take both a pregnant patient and someone. I, I needed basically like four or five doctors to accept taking me in. And that was the possibility of that was going to take hours. So we're left with our first choice of deciding if we're going to stay and just whichever hospital will take us, take us, or if we were going to leave, check ourselves out and then basically start the process again and go admit ourselves through another ER. And so one, we didn't want to just end up in whatever random hospital was going to take us, not knowing their level of care or anything like that or what they had. Did they have a NICU? All, all of those things. And we decided to check ourselves out and get checked in. It's called Baptist, uh, Baptist Memorial in Jacksonville. That is where we ended up. They have a wonderful NICU. Uh, we checked ourselves in. It was Friday, like, well, I guess it was Saturday morning by the time we actually got to a room. And they did a CT scan, which, and an MRI. The CT scan had already shown the mass from my original ENT, but they wanted a specific one and then an MRI. It showed a very large mass in my face. So then they had to figure out what it was. One doctor was saying it looked like this, which was basically a non-malignant, non-cancerous growth. And then another doctor is saying it looks like cancer. Basically, they couldn't do anything about that until they got a biopsy. However, being pregnant, I did not want to go under anesthesia. And so they were going to do the biopsy with me awake, and they were going to do a local anesthesia. But because the chances were it was going to bleed a lot, they wanted to do it in the operating room. And so that was when our experience with advocacy really started. One, I mean, we were still just scared and shell-shocked, and my poor husband is just watching his wife have to do all of these tests and things, and it's all happening so quickly. But we did not want anesthesia, and we did not want, they kept offering me, I'm pretty sure I'm right, fentanyl. They kept offering me fentanyl. And I was like, I am not taking fentanyl. No. They were like, well, it really helps with pain. It is actually meant for medical purposes. It, it's used during labor and delivery on occasion, so the baby will be okay. And I said, we still just said no. As the sister of someone who died of a drug overdose, I've just never touched, I'd, like, I'd never touched anything. I'd never, you know, smoked the green leaf. I'd never, you know, done, I just had stayed away from all kinds of substances. And fentanyl is the one you hear that's like huge, but it's because it's become such a large street drug and all of that. But my sister's fiance, who is a DEA agent, he, um, he said the same thing. He said it is, it was made for medical purposes. It, you know, works well, you'll be okay. But we still decided that I was not going to do the fentanyl. So we go into the pre-op and they let my husband come in and the anesthetic, Diesiologist comes in and he comes and talks to me about putting me under. And I said, no, no, I'm not going under. Like, I don't need anesthesia. So that was the first miscommunication between the doctors. So he's like, no, no, then why am I here? And I said, I don't know, but I'm not going under. And I could tell Andrew was getting really frustrated. So the anesthesiologist leaves to go figure out what's going on. The doctor, who I had been seeing um, 
like the oncological ENT who I'd been seeing, he comes in, he says, you're not going under. I just have the anesthesiologist here, you know, in case, or in case I decide in the operating room that I want the fentanyl or want some kind of something, basically. He's just there as a precaution. He, the man is literally getting paid to sit there in the room. Fine. Totally fine. But I'm not going under. So we get that cleared up. I go in and they start the biopsy and it is painful as heck. Very painful. But I was doing okay. You know, I was just trying to stay calm. They had on calming music. Oh, no, they didn't. I turned on. I had them turn on country. So we were listening to some uh, 80s, 90s country. And I kept waiting for him to use the local anesthesia, but he was saying where it was. He would use it once they got, like, further in. Well, I guess I was doing so well, they decided not to use the local anesthesia, which was fine. I was. I was. I was doing okay. It ended up being a 30-minute procedure, but... The anesthesiologist, who is probably like, I need to do something, he keeps coming up behind me and like asking me, he's like, do you want, do you want anything? Do you want the fentanyl? Do you want, and I'm like, no, I'm okay. I'm okay. I kept saying, I'm okay. I don't, I don't want it. And they didn't give it to me. But when they finish the procedure, it was like 30, 30, 40 minutes maybe from start to finish. I mean, it was bleeding a lot. It was very, very painful and uncomfortable, but made it through. No local anesthesia, no fentanyl, and they wheel me out to the post-op. And I'm pretty sure the nurses back there are not used to people coming out of the surgery rooms awake and not out of it at all. And I just, I kept asking if, you know, my husband could come back. And they said, they were very like, no, they, they don't come back. And I said, look, or maybe I had asked about multiple people because everyone was in the waiting room. My parents, my best friend, my sister, Andrew, everyone was out in the waiting room. And I said, can you please at least let my husband back because I know he's freaking out. And so they, again, even if you're, having to fight or pull teeth, like, just ask what you need. And they did it. They let him come back. And thank God they did because he comes back and he is hopefully okay with me sharing this. But physically, he was way worse off than I was. He was shaking. He was not, like, I was worried he was going to have a heart attack. Um, I had never seen him like that. He was just... His whole body was convulsing, and I was just, I was, like, holding his hand. I was like, it's okay. I'm okay. And he asked me, he's like, did they give you the fentanyl? And I said, no. And he's like, like, his whole body kind of just relaxed. Um, He was still shaking, but it was like a weight had gotten lifted off of him. When they went out to tell them how the biopsy went, someone told him they had given me the fentanyl. And it's probably because the doctor, the ENT who was doing the procedure, he just assumed that the anesthesiologist had given it to me because he had been asking, you know, a couple things. He didn't know I had told him, no, I don't need it. And so Andrew already has a large, like, We've never been medical people. We went to the doctor, like, you know, I went and got my pap smears when I needed it, but Andrew's never been to the doctor. But I I think he went to the doctor one time when we were first together, which was 20 years ago. Um, and so just from other things, he has a large hesitancy around medical things because he thinks things like that happen. like. You tell them no, they do something anyways. And so he then is just getting more and more nervous, untrustworthy of what's going on. But I told him no, they did not give me fentanyl. 
and he was okay, but he did go out and speak with the doctor and just say, this is what happened. Like, I need to know I can trust this team and was, I guess, very firm <laughs> and adamant about that. And sometimes you just have to be, those doctors were wonderful. Our doctor there, because Andrew went out and asked him, they came back, the biopsy was positive for squamous cell carcinoma. They were telling me basically they couldn't do anything surgically at that point without me losing like my whole face basically. Um, and they, you know, and I'm at this point, I'm still 30 weeks pregnant. So the Andrew asked them if this was your wife and your baby, would you stay here or would you look like, would you go somewhere else? And they were very honest and they were great and said, really with as extensive as what's going on with her, she needs a specialist. And they recommended Miami, which we did not end up going with, but they recommended Miami. We did do a consult with the doctor down there, um, but it ended up being the same procedure that they were going to do here in Orlando, where I would be able to be close to my community. And I think that is huge too, is making sure you have a community and someone else to advocate for you. Even myself, who I was with it and coherent the whole time, once we then got into the actual medical diagnosis advocacy, that was even crazier because we got, you know, second and third opinions, but you're now having all of this information thrown at you. And I eventually just, it just became a fog. And so my, I have a friend who is a social worker and just, she basically switched on her social worker brain and was at most of my early appointments and came and asked the right questions, helped us navigate what to ask, kept a notebook so that we had notes. We also tried to record all of our meetings, all of our appointments early on. And it, please know that you can do that. You can record your appointments because all of the information that they give you in those appointments, you're going to walk out the door and remember maybe half of it because it's so much information. And you're having to make the choices that are best for you. And it's just very hard to kind of keep a straight head. So advocate for yourself, but also appoint someone that can advocate for you because it's a big deal. And so basically the next thing we had to decide was they, the options were to do a first round of chemo with her in me or deliver her early. And so we went and got her checked out. Uh, we'd been working with a midwife before. So we went, uh, you know, it was, we knew it was going to have to be at the hospital. So we quickly switched. They measured the baby, did a new ultrasound and found out she was, she weighed enough and her lungs were developed enough. And thank God she was, she was developed enough to deliver early. And that was the decision we made. And it's hard making a decision knowing either way we felt like we were putting her at risk. We did not want to do chemo with her inside me though. We did not want to expose her to that. So the alternative was knowing we would expose her to the NICU most likely. They did say babies that were over four pounds could uh, not have to go in the NICU. It was just something I googled. But the hospital she was born at, any baby born before 34 weeks immediately goes to the NICU. And we get admitted. We thankfully, I assumed it was going to have to be a C-section, but they ultimately said, no, it would be better for your body going into chemo to deliver vaginally. And so I said, great. That was what I wanted. They were really open. Like we were doing a midwife originally. We were going to do a non-medicated uh, birthing center birth. And so 
immediately having to switch to the hospital. You know, we were so worried about they're going to want to have me in bed the whole time, make, you know, get an epidural, all of these things. And they were actually great. They, I was going to be able to labor as long as I needed. Um, obviously, I would have to start Pitocin, which I didn't want to do, but we're trying to have a baby basically at that point. It was now two weeks. They gave us two weeks and we delivered at 32 weeks. But we did as minimally invasive uh, procedures basically to start labor. They did a balloon thing and nobody needs those gory details. But we opted for that first because it was non-medicated. We did eventually end up getting Pitocin. I was, it had been, I think, 24 hours at that point. Then we did Pitocin and unfortunately, well, or I mean, she's healthy, she's here. So fortunately, whatever way it needed to work out, obviously it did, but I, the balloon, they finally were able to take that out. I felt like I was progressing well, and so the midwife came in. They have you have a midwife if you're uh, planning to do a vaginal delivery. She came in and immediately checked me and said, go get the obstetrician. Um, my, I had a prolapsed cord which meant it was below the baby and was going to come out first. And I guess that's not really, really not good. Um, they immediately, the room immediately changed. The midwife left. The obstetrician came in. She stayed in. She did not leave the room. But all of a sudden, nurses, NICU nurses, people are coming in, and she's telling me that I can't sit up. I basically had to lay prone. Uh, they were worried that if I sat up, the cord was going to come out. And so within 10 minutes, I was back in a delivery room. Well, an operating room. And in that quick scenario, it's so hard to keep your head about you, but you, again, have to because you have still have to advocate for yourself. I go in, they're doing it. I, I couldn't even sit up for them to do the spinal tap to numb, numb me for surgery. So I had to be on my side, curled up in a ball, but that can make doing the tap hard. And so they're kind of having to dig in there and I'm screaming and finally tell them, you know, I tell them I think they that it's in. I mean, they know when it is and when it isn't too, but that finally goes in. But they we were still wanting her to be attached to the cord as long as possible, but that changes in an OR. And so they but they we voiced and made that clear and they left her attached to the cord once she came out as long as they could. And we were grateful for that. <clears throat> they let us see her, and then they immediately took her to the NICU. And again, you have to make the decision. Do you have your husband stay with you? Do you have him go with the baby? And I wanted him to go with her, so he went with her. Thankfully, my family was there. They then brought them into the post-op once I got into the post-op room. And so it was my mom and my dad and uh, a friend of mine in the post-op room with me while Andrew was with the baby. They wheeled me up when they, before they were taking me to the room, they wheeled me up to her room to see her for two minutes. Again, I'm still laid out on a stretcher. Um, and then I was not allowed to see her after that for 12 hours because I was not allowed to get up basically. And so then I was able to go see her and do all of those things, but they started I had, I think, three days, and then they started my chemo in the hospital. And again, I had to advocate for myself because I could have started chemo, and they would have then sent me home. 
on the pump, but because she was in the NICU, they, we discussed it. They allowed me to stay over the entire course of my chemo and thank goodness it worked out that she was doing so well that we were able to go home together. But while we're advocating for me, you're also having to advocate now for a baby who we wanted to be on breast milk. I obviously wasn't going to be able to feed her breast milk the way we wanted because I'm on chemo, but they do have a breast milk bank at the hospital and actually encourage preemies to be on breast milk until, I want to say it was, I can't remember how many days, but then they planned to switch them to formula and we asked if she could please be on the donated breast milk longer and we were able to do that. So she was on donated breast milk. I was able to give her some of my colostrum before I started chemo. So we were big about trying to get as much of that as possible and they were wonderful. They used that and then used the donated breast milk. But again, that was something we really had to ask and be specific about. And then there was other things we had to let go of, like, or not that we had to, but that we chose to let go of to make it easier on everyone, really. Um, we planned to use a specific kind of diaper. They use Pampers there, and the diapers that we were going to use don't have preemie size anyways, so it didn't matter, really. But we just said, you know, use the diapers you have for her. Don't, you know, we're not going to worry about the diapers. We're not going to worry about bringing in our glass bottles. We wanted her to be on glass bottles and she has been since she got home. <clears throat> but in the NICU, you know, they're on the little baby bottles. I mean, she was drinking very little and we just, as an advocate, <coughs> <coughs> you have to choose where to give and where to push. And that's, that's probably the biggest takeaway is making sure you're on top of the information you're given, making sure you look at all your choices and your options, and then having to make the decisions, and that's the hardest part, um, but having to make the decisions of wh where to fight and push back if you need to, and where to give it a little bit. Um, so, this, I think, got a lot longer than I planned for it to, but the basic end of it is advocate, advocate, advocate for yourself, or if you're advocating for someone else, God bless you, and you just have to be on top of things, and heaven knows we were not on top of things from time to time. But we had help, and then we knew, you know, when you're thrown into this world, you only know so much, and you're given all this new information, but you have to be strong in knowing what you would want and make the decisions the best you can, and then voice those. Voice, voice, voice. You have to use your voice, because like I said, they have so many patients that they're seeing. Honestly, I think a lot of our doctors come into the room having read the chart right before they come in. Some of them, when we're in the room, uh, it, I think it's just the nature of the beast. They're, I'm sure, overworked, overpatiented, and... You just have to be, once you have their attention and you have them in the room, if you don't let them go for a little while and you have questions, you ask your questions. You get the answers you need and you just use your voice. And that's the biggest advice I guess I can give for advocating for yourself, whether you're in the hospital or if you're going through a medical diagnosis and having tons of appointments with tons of people all the time. Uh, if you are thrown into this world, I hope you're not, but if you are, my thoughts are with you. If you have any questions about how things worked in the hospital for us, 
anything like that. I am doing a live, hopefully, tomorrow afternoon around the same time, so around, well, this video is going up later, but <coughs> around noon Eastern time tomorrow, dependent on baby's nap. If she goes down on, at, on time, it will be at noon. If she doesn't, it will be a little after, but I am going to go live, so you're welcome to come on and ask any questions. I'm answering a few questions that I missed from the last live and just kind of checking in because I haven't been on here really. Um, one was just trying to be present as much as I could. I was having some tough days, and then we got the information about the surgery that's going to and just trying to process all that. So that's where we're at. But hopefully I will see you tomorrow if you are going to join the live. And if not, again, feel free to comment with any questions about advocating in a medical situation. And I'll do the best I can to share what we did, what helped us, what didn't work, all of that. All right. Thanks for watching. Bye.